Uh, as Karen mentioned, what I'm going to talk about today is iterative. It's in progress. It's something we've learned that we just want to share. It is in no way perfect. It's no way a solution for everybody who's ever going to be publishing a textbook. It's what we've learned works well and is a tool that we use and a process we use um, uh, working with faculty and helping them create something that's that um, helping them create something that they uh, a textbook that they can envision that's good. So. Um, so anyway, I want to start off with that and thank you all for, for coming here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is basically, um, uh, you know, the Open Textbook Network really started out to, with uh, focused on adoptions of open textbooks and open textbooks that, that already exist, right? And so they're out there, they're kind of the low hanging fruit. But as we've traveled around, ran workshops for faculty, uh, talked with um, staff, librarians, and so on at institutions, it became clear there was a real appetite for publishing as well. And so we have spent the last probably two and a half years trying to get a better understanding of what it takes to publish a textbook. And we are definitely still learning. Uh, and, and a large degree of thanks goes to all of the institutions we're working with is, and, and the cooperative and the other institutions we've talked with that have helped us understand this. So. So what I'm going to talk about today comes from uh, some of that digging deep into the actual in the dirt, uh, on the ground, I guess might be a cleaner way of saying that, on their ground discussions we've had with faculty about what they need and what, and um, about publishing a textbook. So it's a very um, kind of a step-by-step -step process uh, that um, I'm going to walk through here. If you've opened up uh, the module, I, what I'm going to do is just kind of walk through it and try to explain it and how it works and why it works. Um, I'm also going to share my screen here, so hopefully this is working okay. Okay, good. Um, and so again, uh, I'll, I'll put a plug in for this open uh, uh, curriculum that uh, many people have worked hard on, Karen in particular, that's out here. And this is just one little piece of it. So please, uh, we're putting it out there for the open community, please use it. Uh, so this particular process came from working with about 15 different instructors a couple of years ago, over the last two years, I guess, uh, and trying to help them design uh, textbooks. One thing that we discovered uh, early on, which is probably obvious uh, to most of you, but if, if oftentimes if you, if you ask a faculty to write, they will write. They will write what they know and they'll put it all down perfect. It's exact, you know, that's, that's what we ask them to do. If we want it to be a textbook, that's a different thing. That's an additional thing, right? So um, just want to point out as Karen first asked that question, you know, you're probably uh, ask the question, what makes a textbook a textbook? Um, I'd like to know the answer to that question. I don't have a really great answer to it. Uh, but I, I guess I would say that basically it is this content, but wrapped in it is actually instructional design. Okay, like my, my PhD program was in curriculum and instruction. They, they name it that way because curriculum and instruction are two different things. Curriculum is you can think of as content, is what you want students to know, and instruction is the process of teaching it. A textbook is primarily, we think of it at primarily as curriculum, as content, right? Um, but what makes a textbook a textbook, I think, is the attempt to design the textbook in a way that helps students learn, right? And so this first diagram up on the top here really is a, it's just a simple uh, uh, illustration of that, you can see a monograph on the left, which is just the content dumped on the page. And the book has some structure to it. It probably has chapters and it might have sections to it, but then it's just content. It's just the written word. If you look on the right, that's the, the OpenStax biology book. That's one page. That's the first page of chapter one. What things there are helping students learn? Look at that. See how many things you can pick out that are helpful for learning. A big part of, 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 of learning is context and structure, is understanding um, how this piece of something that I'm going to learn fits into the larger context of this field or this, uh, this, this 
what I'm going to be taught. So if you look at this, they use everything from font size, font color, the styling, the styling within the, you see the chapter outline there is in a box, it's in a green box, and then it basically gives you the outline of what's to come in the chapter. Um, there is an introduction, which is just basically setting you up. Here's what you're going to be learning. There are learning objectives. There is an image here. There's all the content, frankly, that pretty much everything on this page is structured to help students learn. The content itself about the study of life isn't even on this page, really. These are just summaries, structures, and so on. Okay. So what we found is that faculty generally need help getting from a monograph to a textbook, getting from simply content to content and structure, content and structure that helps students learn. And what we found is what I'm going to go over here today not only provides structure to get to a textbook that helps students learn, but the structure also at the same time will help faculty write. It will help kind of, um, you know, your work is cut out for you phrase. It basically helps kind of cut out their work for them, giving them a structure to kind of work within. Okay, so um, here we go. So let's start with the simple highest level structure of a textbook. And that's the first question we'll sit down and ask, what do you want this textbook to look like? What do you imagine it's gonna have? And so if we start at um, the book, obviously being the highest level, the whole book, the whole, the book is gonna be broken up into what pieces. And so you can see three different options here, right? You can just say a book has chapters and chapter has sections that were done, or, a book might have units and a unit might have chapters and a chapter might have sections and a sections might have subsections or any variation of those things. It's a pretty easy decision, pretty simple decision, but it's something that we'll just start with so that we have this very highest level book structure that's to, that, um, that we ask instructors to identify. Okay. Um, once that's identified, that then really defines the whole high level book. Right, you have the book, the book has chapters, each chapter has sections, right? This would be an example of this first one, book, chapter, section. And you would have, this really illustrates just chapter one, but you would have that same tree structure then for each chapter, right? That's pretty obvious, okay. Okay, so you need to start with that because that's the high level. Structural elements then, these elements are really the interesting part. And these are, these are the pieces that help students learn. These are the pieces that oftentimes, per, perhaps, without our assistance and kind of prompting, instructors might not think about, okay? So these instructional, these structural elements is what we're calling them, are the pieces that, for instance, we see in this, this uh, the OpenStax book here, that we will add to provide help and learning. And I've broken them up into three categories, what we call openers, we call closers, and then down here a little bit, integrated pedagogical devices. I think I should find a simpler name than that. Uh, but openers are basically things that you find at the beginning of a chunk of the textbook. So it could be a textbook has openers. Could be a chapter has openers. Could be a section has openers. Okay, so if you again look, if we look up at this example, every chapter in this biology book from OpenStax has a chapter outline, it has a banner image, it has an introduction, and it has these learning objectives that by the end of this unit, you will be able to, right? It's consistent across the whole book. That is what students expect. They expect a structure that's consistent, that'll help them learn. So, so it could be a, burning, a banner image, learning objectives, an introduction, so on. And there is a link here that'll bring you, if you click on this too, a list of some common things that publishers will use for openers. Closers, similarly, are things that come at the end of a chunk. So it could be the end of the book, it could be at the end of a chapter, it could be at the end of a section or whatever. Uh, they could be review problems, a summary of the chapter, links to external resources, right? I mean, if you think about textbooks, you know you've seen all these things, right? And they usually are things that we think of as coming in the, in the back of the, uh, the textbook. Um, 
So if we think about the textbook, um, if we look at a chapter, for instance, if this is a chapter, the chapter might have an openers like learning objectives, introduction, focus questions, have the main content in some form. It might be broken up into sections. And then it will have some closers. Um, notice that this can happen again at multiple levels. Let's say the main content of this chapter is actually a section, is sections. The section itself then could have openers, closers, and main content, right? Should I be stopping for questions or uh, do we want to wait? The plan was to wait, but I see him rolling in. There is a question, Dave, on uh, evidence for the highly structured approach. And I think I may be able to track something down. So um, we'll put that question on hold, which Jonathan says is fine if you want to keep rolling on. Okay, is it, does that mean evidence as in evidence of its success? Yes. like. Okay. The, the structure of a textbook makes. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I will take a quick stab at that. And I am no expert in textbook design. I mean, we, what I'm going to talk about today is lessons learned from working with faculty, really. But I will say that I've spent um, I don't even know how many, a couple decades, probably working on online courses. And there's a lot of research about structure in online courses. And the way we usually think, the way that instructional designers that I've been working with, um, uh, their whole job is to, well, not a big part of their job of instructional design is to provide structure for online courses. And we know there's a ton of evidence there in online course design that that structure is helpful to students um, and facilitates their learning, helps them find the content, helps them put it within context of the other content. Um, and the way that we talk about textbooks oftentimes is I'll say, this is really like for two instructional designers who are used to designing online courses. This is really pretty much exactly like designing an online course, except the end result is not an online course. It is a digital textbook. It's just a different medium uh, when we're done. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there with that. Um, these integrated pedagogical devices are really just elements that live that aren't openers and not closers, but are other pieces of content that are connected, that are within the main content of the, of the section, chapter, or whatever it happens to be. Oftentimes, these pedagogical devices are intended, are, are, are um, focused on meeting some specific needs, like for instance, um, the biography element. Oftentimes you'll see in a textbook, the biography, if maybe it's a biology textbook, it's a biography of a famous uh, biologist, or it's a biography of a biologist who's working in the field right now on something really interesting, or it's a biologist who, um, who can maybe connect with the students in the course for some reason. And so typically those biographies are really laid out there to show that these are people. These are people, I mean, they have some goals that they're trying to accomplish by putting this element in the book, right? A case study sometimes will, will, will say, it, if it will address the goal of saying, I wanna take this content and I wanna see how, to, well, how does that really work in the real world? A case study is exactly the element you'd want to show okay, I know we just talked about all this abstract stuff. Here is a case study of what's of, of its application in the real world. So um, there are a number of different elements like this that, that we can integrate into the content. And, um, and again, they uh, will typically be there to provide extra insight or scaffold uh, some goals that we really want them students to understand. So again, there's a list of some common integrated pedagogical devices there. Okay, so so those are the those are that's the basics of what we're talking about here. We have these elements that we want to put in the textbook to help students learn. Right. The question is, how do we get authors to work with these things? And not only do we want them to work with them, but we want them to do it in, as, in a consistent way, right? A textbook's um, part of the instructional design of the textbook is its consistency. 
chapter to chapter, section to section. Students know what to expect. They know that when they see the blue box with the blue heading, that those are, oh, those are learning objectives or those are, right, it, it helps lower the barriers to learning by um, providing this context. So, so here's what we did. And we, we've written this, um, I've, I've written this section to be technology agnostic. There's no technology involved in this except for uh, magical post-it notes invented right here in Minnesota. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is exactly what I, the, the technology that we use to work with the, fact, the instructors that I worked with. We sat down with them and had them um, structure their book in the way I'm going to show you here with sticky notes and it worked beautifully actually. Um, so we're going to start out, like I, like I said, we're going to start out at the very highest level. We're just going to say, please describe uh, the structure, the, the highest level structure of a book. So in this example, book, chapter, sub, section, subject, and let's just say that that's what they decided they wanted to do. We would have them then look at each level starting at the book level and say, what elements do you want in this book? In the, in, in, at the book level, what elements at, live at the book level? And there are openers, there are closers, and then there's the main content. So for the book, in this example, the instructor wants to make sure there's a cover page, wants to make sure there's a table of contents. Some of these things are so basic, they hardly need mentioning, but it isn't unhelpful to actually have the instructor think about, I mean, just to be aware that this will exist on your book. And then at the end, they want an index and they want a glossary. Okay, pretty simple book structure, right? The next thing we would do then is go down to the chapter. So you notice that we include chapters in here and there might be 20 chapters, but we're just gonna put one placeholder chapter in there, right? That's where all the chapters are gonna live. And then we define what a chapter looks like. And in this example, the instructor says a chapter, I want a little intro paragraph. I want a chapter outline. I want to list the learning objectives. I want to list key terms up front. I want sections then. So those are all openers. Those are all things that at the beginning of every chapter, you'll have intro, chapter outline, objectives, and key terms. At the end of every chapter, you'll have discussion questions and case studies. And so we would then go to the section and we would do the same for the section, which would of course have subsections and every subsection then we would also define. And they might have openers, they might have closers and so on. So there, um, you can see how the structure is building level by level, right? Okay, so, so far, we haven't even talked about the content of the book, right? We haven't talked about biology. We haven't talked about whatever this book is about. We're just saying, what are the pieces that you want? Um, I want to add a caveat to this. I think we are way, uh, I think we need a lot more work here in this area to attach these different elements to actual learning objectives and having elements that will address learning objectives specifically. Uh, right now, the way that we worked with these faculty is we kind of relied on them and their expertise to say, what pieces do you think will be useful to your students? We don't get into depth about why and what specifically, how is this gonna help them meet their learning objectives? I think we should go deeper in that area. Right now, uh, we need a little more work on that. Okay, so the next step that we went through then is basically content structure, right? We are working, um, uh, now we're gonna talk about the content. Um, in this case, let's talk about biology, for instance, right? So the term scope and sequence is usually more of a K-12 kind of word. I don't, I don't hardly ever hear it used uh, in higher education, but it basically the scope means what's the breadth? What's the breadth? What are you gonna cover? What's the scope of the book? Defining that, and then defining the sequence in which it will be covered. What comes first, you know, what comes second, and so on. And those are important discussions to have. When, I, when we worked with some of these instructors uh, in the last two years, they were working in teams, and we basically asked them to, again, we had them use sticky notes, and they, they had, they've taught these classes for a long time. They knew what concepts needed to be addressed. They together um, collectively just went through and, see, and, and defined all, here's all the things we need to cover. 
and then they sat down and sorted them into, into the sequence. And you're going to have disagreements between the structures on that. And I give this example here. Um, I give this example of an OpenStax chemistry book that, that I believe it was revised. Uh, is Kathy in here? I believe it was re revised by uh, UConn uh, instructors, was my memory at least. Sorry if I'm wrong there. Um, and they decided they wanted to teach the concept of atoms first behind, before other elements. And so they worked with OpenStax to actually sh move content around because they didn't agree with the sequence of the chemistry book as OpenStax had published it. So you're going to get disagreement there, but, um, but it's important to agree on that up front. Okay, and then once you have that, basically you fit it into this structure that you've built, right? You have a book, chapter, section, subsections, and, and you should you work with them to work that out. It's, uh, um, I just said that in 10 seconds, it will take a long time to get this kind of pushed through, especially if there's multiple authors. Um, but you wanna end up with a structure like this. And so I just yanked this out. This is the actual book structure, I believe, of the biology book of OpenStax. And so, uh, you know, here's unit two. Unit two is the cell. Chapter four is cell structure. Section 4.1, two, three, five, so, and so on. And then you can see here's unit three and so on. They have a book structure of book, unit, chapter, section at a high level. Once you have this structure, this content structure mapped out, and once you have this kind of element structure mapped out, you have everything you need to map out the whole book. And this is the piece I think that um, uh, it, it's, this is kind of the magic of doing both of these things and then integrating them together. So if we look, for instance, at, let's look at this example. Um, sorry, I hope you're not getting seasick on me uh, as I move the screen around. Uh, here are two chapters, chapter 11, chapter 12 of this textbook. Here, is this the element structure they agreed on before they wrote the book, right? This is, they have a book, chapter, section. This is what a book has in it. This is what a chapter has in it. And this is what the section is. This is the content structure, chapter 11 and 12. So if you combine these two structures, you can now say, all right, the very first thing in this book is gonna be the cover page, right? Here's the book structure. The next thing it's gonna have is a table of contents. It's going to, at the end, have an index and a glossary. For each chapter, so here's chapter 11, there's going to be an intro, objectives, and key terms. So you see that? Here's chapter 11, intro, objectives, key terms. And then there's, in this chapter, there's two sections. And each section is going to have the main content, and it's going to have review questions. Here's section 2, 11.2, uh, review questions, or main content, review questions. And then there's going to be discussion questions at the end of each chapter. So that repeats itself for each chapter. Intro, objectives, key terms, review questions at the end. Uh, oh, I missed one. Discussion questions at the end of the chapter. And then each section is structured the way a section is, is structured. So when you're done, when you combine these two st structures, the content structure and the element structure, you end up with basically an outline of the whole book, of everything that needs to be written. So that's what I said at the beginning when I said, uh, not only does this process help you end up with a better textbook that ensures that you use some of these elements and is more consistent, but it actually will help the instructor by, you know, their work is cut out for them now. They know exactly what they need to do. They need to write an introduction for this chapter 11. They need to write key objectives. They need to write key terms. They need to write the main content for section 11.1. They need to write review questions and so on. They, every, just go down the list. It's like a checklist. Um, so uh, when it comes down to it, um, what I, this, is, this is why we found it to be successful because writing a book can be an overwhelming task. It really can. It, it's just huge and it takes many months of time and any kind of structure that you can give that not only helps them, but ends up, end up, end up, ensures that you end up with something better 
and if you hadn't, um, you want to use that. And that's how we've that's how we've that's why we find this useful. I want to make a few just really simple um, notes here, a uh, few comments. When coming up with the structure, especially the content structure like this, like this. I made a note of it in here in the text here. I want to. You should know that in 2012 there was actually a lawsuit. There were a number of publishers who 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 sued Boundless, and they sued Boundless not because they copied the content of the books per se, but Boundless copied, or at least that's what they asserted, the structure of the book, the outline, like this. What Boundless was trying to do, Boundless was trying to say. This, this commercial textbook over here, look, we have the same outline, but it has open content in it. So you can use this one to replace that one. And it was a kind of a, they were trying to say, look, this is equivalent to that one. It should be an easy swap, right? And so it made sense for them to try to, to just take the structure of the book and copy it up. Uh, they were sued. And so what was claimed basically was, uh, and there may be some on the line who know more about this than I do, but uh, it was claimed that they claim copyright on the structure of the book and that it was a copyright violation and so on. So uh, they settled. There was never any, uh, uh, there was never, it was never decided in court who was right and who was not. And can you actually copyright this kind of thing? Is this, how close is this getting to be copywriting facts, which you can't do? Um, it was, they settled. So unfortunately we don't know what you can and can't do, but just be aware of that. It's something that if you're working with instructors, to make them aware of, so they don't just go to their book and say, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna copy the outline of this book. Uh, they might think that that may not be a nice, easy way to get to where they wanna go. Um, and even if they come up with it on their own, they're likely, it's likely gonna be very similar to the book they just got done using. But just to make you aware uh, of that. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, I, I guess you know, I, I would just then throw out um, a couple of caveats to this. Um, like I said, I don't know that, the, I know that this isn't gonna work for everybody. Um, this, I kind of put together because I work this way. I, when I write, I write an outline and I fill in the outline. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, she just writes. I don't know how she does it. And then when she's done, she rearranges it to a way that makes sense to her. So she actually ends up with the outline kind of in a way. Um, so again, I wanna just point out that I'm not saying necessarily that this is the best case for absolutely everybody, um, but it's a tool that we've found, a process that we've found uh, to be useful for many to give them the, to remind them number one, uh, we don't wanna end up with a monograph. We want you to think about consistency and elements. And number two, um, we're gonna help you structure this to make the job easier writing.